First, thank you um, for the invitation and really looking forward to, to sharing the stage with Jack and sharing a little bit of a, a vision that, that we've been working on at the Heart Association, but honestly, it, and hopefully you'll hear in my remarks, this is really not very much about us, but all about what all of, that we can do as a community. So I'm gonna start with a, about a three minute video to, to start off some of my time this morning with us, but I wanted to put this disclosure slide up first just to make sure that everyone's very clear that I am an employer of the Heart Association and the AHA does generate some funds from the CPR and first aid work that we do, so just please keep that in mind through the course of watching this video and anything else that I have to say uh, uh, this morning. Let's go ahead and play the video and then I'll come back after about three minutes. Unconscious. My dad, your dad? Oh, his blood's turning purple. That one. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. I want to give you something to think about. It's a number, a big number, about 475,000. 475,000 isn't just a number. It's people, people who died from cardiac arrest in one year in the United States. Big number, bigger opportunity, because we can get that number down to zero. We can save all those lives. We can create a world where no one dies from cardiac arrest. Am I dreaming? No, I'm not a dreamer. I'm a visionary, and I'm asking you to be too. I want you to see it first, that world, and then do your part to make it happen. I need you to believe in your heart that it is possible, and then focus all you do, help focus all we do on that goal, on saving every single one of those people. Because we can do it. It is within our reach. How do we get there? You know how we get there. We'll create systems that automatically detect cardiac arrest and activate an emergency response. We'll mobilize an army of trained and prepared responders to provide immediate CPR and defibrillation. This means pairing 911 response with bystanders through mobile technology, ensuring public access to AEDs and more training through schools and kiosks. We'll remove barriers to getting bystanders engaged, creating tri-standers in the general public. We'll eliminate preventable cardiac arrest in hospitals using monitoring for early detection and rapid response teams that will stabilize patients immediately. We'll make sure all healthcare providers deliver high quality CPR with innovative quality improvement tools and sessions. And finally, we'll personalize resuscitation to each patient, leveraging the latest technology to identify and treat underlying causes. To get that 475,000 down to zero. It starts with you right now. You're doing good work. We do good work. That has laid the groundwork for us to be truly extraordinary. Believe in the vision. Let it drive everything you do each day. Let it rise up in you like a shout, joining the voices of your colleagues, teammates, neighbors, and family. And then look around. See that number start to decline, life by precious life, bit by bit, until that one glorious day when everyone who would have died before all this work instead wakes up groggy and thankful in a hospital to greet his or her family. And we arrive gloriously at zero. Because of you, because of our vision, a world where no one dies from cardiac arrest. Let's get started. So, let's see if I can, awesome. So, that's just a bit of a vision of what we're really trying to do, and I'll try to frame that within the context of, of education in the future. But first, what are you thinking when you hear this vision, when you think about this, creating a world where no one dies from cardiac arrest? In the front of your mind, in your gut, in the quiet thoughts in the back of your own head, 
What do you really think about that? So, so those are all good thoughts. And we're, I hope as I talk here for a few minutes, we'll think, uh, I'm going to share some of my thoughts about this. And we're hopefully going to have a chance to talk about some of those thoughts. And I hope that I can also, we together can think about the different ways that we can tackle this goal. And so, uh, one thought you might have is even why this goal? Why this particular goal? And so I just want to give a quick bit of history. Again, now this is just, you know, a conflict of interest, my uh, view or bias, my AHA hat on. So in 2010, a group of AHA staff and uh, volunteer leaders, including people like V and I, were sitting and reflecting and honestly, well, first thinking about what was going to be our 2020 goal. To do that required us to reflect a bit on what we'd actually accomplished in the prior decade. And I would say that we were both uh, happy and perhaps even a bit um, proud. And, and that's nothing wrong with being proud of the fact that we had trained a lot more people. And everyone in this room, Red Cross, others, had trained a lot more people from 2000 to 2010. That's fantastic. But when we were very self-reflective, we realized that the outcomes from cardiac arrest hadn't nearly doubled or tripled as the amount of training had. And so we had some very reflective moments saying, what do we want to be over this next decade? Training is completely, absolutely critical and essential to saving more lives. So please don't hear me say anything different. But it's necessary but not sufficient to save more lives. And so we started thinking about what more could we do in addition to training more people that could actually start doing things like what we ended up setting as our 2020 goal of doubling bystander CPR response rates and doubling cardiac arrest uh, survival. We set those goals knowing we didn't have a clue how to get there. Well, we had ideas, but we didn't really know how we could do that. And it honestly created some conversation about what if we set a goal that we don't reach? How will we feel about that? When we set those goals knowing we didn't have the answer for how to get there, in part to stimulate thinking to think about not only how do we train more people, but how do we affect that entire system of care, that entire chain of survival that we're all familiar with. And that led to things such as uh, creating CPR as a high school graduation requirement, which still ultimately leads to getting people trained, but that's not something we had thought about before, thinking about how to leverage advocacy and public policy to help strengthen that chain of survival in each community. And so that was one of the things that I think this new stretch goal for us in 2010 helped us think a bit differently about. But over the last couple of years, you know, I felt like we could be doing more, and I think we've all thought we could be doing more. And while we're on a trajectory to, to at least be in the ballpark of hitting that 2020 goal, about a year ago, I challenged my team and challenged myself by saying, I want to live in, and I want my two small boys that are five and two to grow up in a world where no one dies from cardiac arrest. And so to me, that challenge and that opportunity creates more opportunities for us to think differently about all the different ways we can impact our chain of survival in each one of our communities. So now, the next thought you might have is, was this even possible? And we already heard this is going to be hard, it'll take a long time. All could be true, but it doesn't have to be. So why does anything ever happen? Why does anything ever happen? First, you have to think it. I would argue nothing ever happens if you don't at least first think it and at least think about believing it. So if you say, I will absolutely get you that report by Friday at 5 o'clock, there's a good chance that you'll hit send by 5 o'clock. Maybe you won't, but there's at least a possibility. And you might say it, but if you're thinking in the back of your head, I'll no, I'm not really going to do that, there's no chance. So the first thing that I you know, just want to present the opportunity for all of us to think about is the possibility that we could save every life. We could save every life. It is possible. It will require a lot of different thinking and a lot of different uh, behaviors on all of our part to make that possible. And so when I think about the future of education, I think very broadly now, not just in the training environment, but educating uh, dispatchers, educating politicians, education through a lot of different forms that we can talk about, especially in the, in the Q&A. But so here, the, the last part that I really like to leave you thinking about is that, you know, it's not just now our thinking, but if you start thinking it, you start believing it. You can start acting on it. You can start making a new outcome. And so to me, that's really the, 
the possibility that we have in thinking differently and thinking about this world where no one can die from cardiac arrest. So then you have to start thinking about, you know, and this large leap, this you know, moonshot, put a, put a person on the moon by the end of the 1960s when we hadn't even had uh, ability to orbit the Earth. How do you start thinking about that? So then you have to start thinking about how do you break this down? And in my mind, it's, you work backwards, or I like to ask myself the question of what needs to be true for that kind of an outcome to be possible? And so one of those things that needs to be true is, as we already heard in the video, this idea of creating systems that automatically detect cardiac arrest. And so, to me, this is one of our big challenges, is unwitnessed cardiac arrest. So we heard it this morning beautifully from both uh, our survivor introduction and the, the award winners this morning for the, uh, for the, the, the family of the, the uh, survivor saved. It's, we need witnessed arrests to be able to really activate that chain of survival. So if I you know, had a, a cardiac arrest in my uh, hotel room this morning, I, there's no chance that the system could ever you know, have helped save my life. And so you ask, well, and what can we do as, as people and organizations to work on that? Directly, I'm not sure. But indirectly, we can think about how to leverage technology that already exists. And so there was an announcement earlier this week, Apple's now doing a, a, a actual study looking at uh, AFib using the Apple Watch. I have no idea where that kind of technology may lead. I'm not, um, not suggesting any uh, off-label uses here, but this idea of technology exists and is coming at us very rapidly where I can imagine a day if you can set aside or think differently about you know, things like privacy concerns and things of those nature, to think about the possibility that every arrest could be witnessed in an ethical, you know, no big brother kind of way, but a way that we could actually then activate the, the chain of survival by everyone actually having a witness to arrest. The next thing, of course, is the best way to survive a cardiac arrest is to never have one. And so I think this is where there's a great opportunity for us to do much more education and training in hospitals and even out of hospitals, but you especially think in hospitals are great opportunities and moments where we could prevent arrest from happening in the first place. So many in-hospital cardiac arrests could potentially be completely avoidable if we had the right systems and right education in place. And to me, that would be a great way for us to really work towards at least that part of, the, of a number becoming zero because you never have the cardiac arrest in the first place. I think it's also an opportunity where there's a lot of great work that is going on with rapid response teams and in pediatric emergency medicine where they think very differently in some cases about taking care of pediatric patients in hospitals than adults. I would argue adults could have you know, just as many preventable causes as uh, that we're not uh, getting at this point through our lack of uh, detection. This is, of course, an obvious one and one where actually it has been exciting to see over the last three to five years. The, impact that technology has had on our ability to mobilize more responders and get more responders just in the right place at the right time. It's been fantastic to watch, and I think we need more of that. We need more people getting activated to be in just the right spot. But this also gets into things like telecommunicator CPR. So that opportunity to say education could also be this idea that knowing that you're going to have a coach and a friend in your ear if we can just get you to call 911 and be willing and able to actually do some CPR and, and go get an AED or have a friend go get the AED until EMS shows up. These kind of teachable moments, these opportunities really change the dynamics. So yes, we continue to hear me say we need to get as many people trained and ready to save a life, but we also need to think of more of these sort of safety nets and just-in-time opportunities to save more lives. I think the other piece here that I should mention is it's also messaging. And so I think, for example, the national collaborative that was established in the Institute of Medicine report a couple of years ago and that we're uh, working together on with the American Red Cross, creating more consistent messaging, broad messaging that can continue to activate the public to be ready to go save your life. This is, this is uh, there, there's no way that any one organization, any one group, any one individual can make all of these things happen. And so some of this is also continue to look at ways that we can collectively, for all of us that are very interested in this community, to, to think about how we can collectively and much more powerfully mobilize uh, responders, both through messaging and through training. This is another one that we've known about for you know, 
you might say 10 or 15 years based on science, and you could potentially say uh, for many that we've known about this for many, many decades, high quality CPR saves lives. We've been talking about this, and now I think we are starting to see technology and tools through both feedback and training and education ways, as well as in actual clinical environments where this is now truly a possibility. And I would uh, dream of a day where that would become more and more the standard of care, where it's not enough to only do CPR. That is always better than nothing. But now we can get more and more people doing CPR where it's about having to do and wanting to do high quality CPR. This is another area where, again, the, from a heart association perspective, we recognize we can't possibly do this alone. And so over a year ago, we formed a collaboration with the Resuscitation Academy in Seattle to help us and us help them train more people, more healthcare professionals in the EMS uh, community around things like high quality CPR. So I, again, want to weave this thread through that this is about collaborations and partnerships and not just about any one organization doing this themselves. And the last thing I'd like to, to end on is, is just to try to wrap up my part of this and leave, make sure we certainly have time for Q&A, is this idea of personalized medicine. And I actually think of this in uh, my shorthand term is uh, medical GPS. And so I think about, you know, it used to, I'm, I'm old enough that, uh, you know, in the late 90s, I would drive home from, from my grad school to Southwest Virginia where my folks were, and I'd have to, until I learned the way, eventually I didn't need a map anymore. We'd print out MapQuest. And, and I am the type, if I missed the turn, I got very stressed out and I'd actually like circle back because I wanted to follow the route because otherwise I'm, I'm lost. Now, I, you don't, I don't, maybe you still do, I don't, I haven't gone to MapQuest in a really long time. You plug in, get out your phone, your GPS device, and you put in, the, put in the location and off you go. All I need to know are the rules of the road, how to play, drive the car and hopefully drive, operate the car safely. But otherwise, I don't need to know where I need to go, where I'm going, I just follow the directions. And if I miss a turn, I'm going to get corrected quite quickly. To me, that's, I see very much a day where that's the same kind of opportunity that at least in the healthcare environment, and I can imagine technology going fast enough that this will happen in our, in our pockets and in our communities as well. You know, thinking about opportunities for augmented reality, thinking about artificial intelligence guiding and coaching us so that dispatchers can see what's happening on the scene, that we can see what's happening on the scene, that healthcare providers don't have to memorize H's and T's anymore. You've got artificial intelligence in your ear describing to you what you need to do. So you're still going, we still need training, we still need education, so I'm not a clinician, so me, you don't want me doing any kind of operation or anything that's uh, clinical invo in, involved. So medical GPS wouldn't work for me. But for those that are trained properly, that medical GPS could be really enhancing and allow this personalized care where you can imagine you're getting real-time feedback over your eye real-time coaching in your ear, real-time uh, information about exactly what that patient needs. And so we continue to need more research as well to help us understand what some of that personalized medicine would be. And the last thing I would say is that while that might sound potentially far-fetched, some may not think it sounds that far-fetched, the airline industry is already doing this. So not only are airline in, the airline industry take, have their mechanics using augmented rea reality in the training environment on their engine turbines, all these different parts and pieces labeled and tagged. If you're not quite sure what to do, you can open up a file and get pictures and information about the different part on the engine airplane. Uh, uh, you can also then phone a friend, phone a supervisor if you want, and get information. That's how they're practicing, but that's also how they're playing. So on the tarmac now, Japanese airlines are actually treating real time. Their mechanics have augmented reality and are fixing airplane engines in real time using using this uh, kind of technology. So it's coming, and I see this as a great opportunity in our uh, space to be able to leverage that technology to really improve patient care. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna stop and uh, turn, my, turn the floor over to Jack. Well, you guys are wonderful, right? This is Friday getaway day, eight o'clock, and you're here. Give yourselves a hand, I mean. <laughs> um, Vinay introduced Brian and I as visionaries. Um, well, uh, perhaps, but uh, remember, there's a fine line between being a visionary and hallucinating. And uh, <coughs> uh, I do want to talk a little bit about the future of uh, CPR education. 
um, and kind of take it from a sweep of a historical perspective. Uh, I will be very, very high level, uh, and I'd like to do it rather quickly so that we can get on to some of your questions. But generally speaking, and I, how do I work this thing here? Do I have to advance the slides? Oh, thank you. All right. Um, uh, trying to advance the slide. Can you guys help me up back, back there? Ah, there we are. Okay. Try it again. The green, the, the green, ah, oh, the big green button. Right. I told you I'm not a visionary. Um, <laughs> but, but quickly, you know, if you think about what's happening, we're in the middle of a big technological sweep. Some people call it the fourth revolution. You know, if the industrial revolution was the last one of about 125 years ago, we're only about halfway through what's happening, and we're all living through it. Think about it, networks, these phones we carry around in our pockets are really little supercomputers that could not have happened without the advances in fiber optic technology that happened you know, with Metcalfe's law and the, and the value of large networks. Um, computing took the next step, Moore's law and what happened in terms of the price of computing. The next big fall is the fall of data, right? Data, big data is coming. You're seeing it in almost everything that we're seeing in new, in new applications in industry and commerce. And it's because data is becoming cheap and accessible. And beyond that, there's, net, there's AI, artificial intelligence and computing. It's all basically a big paradigm shift. It's going to change the way the world works over the next 25 years. Um, and I'm going to give you an example, because I think networks and computing are really there. Big data and AI are coming. And I want to use an example of something where the Red Cross used as its public information distribution uh, mechanism for many years, a thing called a tear sheet. And I'll show you a picture of one in a moment. But it was a prepackaged piece of information that advised people about what to do for first aid, for hurricanes, for tornadoes, all kinds of responses. And we would print them up, store them in warehouses, and try to get them in the hands of people in advance of an impending disaster, like an impending hurricane. You've probably seen these things, you know, 15, 20 years ago. You'd be handed one at the train station or the big box retailer or the uh, uh, supermarket parking lot, and you'd take it, and you probably didn't read it, and you maybe even didn't even take it home. But that was where we were several years ago. That's changed, right? And in uh, my time at the Red Cross, we focused on taking those tear sheets and putting them into digital apps that can be landed on people's phones. We used to hand out about six million of those tear sheets in advance of any kind of a disaster every year. We don't know how many people actually read them. We don't know how effective they really were. Every year now, our apps reach 750 million people, um, 750 million digital pages. About 300 pages are pulled down by people, and we can see what they're reading and how long they're spending on it, so we know whether the information's useful or not. We've put about 250 million alerts into people's phones with those apps for things like hurricanes, tornadoes, and other forms of things. And the thing that's really cool about it is that about 300 million digital pages get pushed by people to their friends and family. So we know that information is really pretty valuable because people are taking the time to push it to somebody they care about. This really couldn't have happened without the first half of that equation there, the networks and the computing. And it's going to get better with big data and with AI. The next great leap really is the marriage of apps to big data and artificial intelligence. It will crack what I like to call the EMS last mile barrier. You know, out of hospital survival rates really won't change until we see a change in the ability of the bystander to be confident in stepping into a situation and um, uh, get doing something before the professional help can arrive. And I believe big data and AI is the place that's going to take us there. Um, so this tear sheet to app transformation, just as an example, it took prepackaged information and made it real time. It took general things. So we didn't know when we were preparing those tear sheets whether the hurricane was going to happen in a swamp in Florida or an urban center in New York. Uh, there were situational updates because now the app can be updated completely as the situation changes. We were able to put alerts in it and we, were all, or we got sharing involved, right? So what you ended up seeing was that's what a tear sheet used, still looks like. We just don't use them anymore. But on the left-hand margin, it was what to do in advance of the event. In the middle, it was what to do in the, in the middle of the event. And the last one, what you do when it's over. Now you've got these digital touches. We have them focused on things that are very specific. So you'll download the Tornado app if you live in Tornado Alley. You won't download it if you live in Maine, right? Um, you'll download the Earthquake app if you live in California. You won't download the Hurricane app if you live in New Mexico. So you, it, it allows you to get much more specific. It allows you to become much more relevant, really, to the individual. But as I say, this is just an example of where I think things are going. 
with the app, what you see, and this is the parts that we're interested in, um, the top uh, ones, I feel much more safer and prepared with this app. You know, this is great. I think I could save someone's life now. Uh, the man in the street confidence, right, that thing that we have to work on on the last mile is really getting the person in the street first, as Brian suggested, educated so they actually can help, and then secondly, confident enough so that they won't stand back and they will help. And so, you know, the big thing that's been happening is, is uh, in, in CPR education is this notion, and ILCOR and the American Heart Association and the IOM, all the great standards bodies have been saying for the last couple of years, we really need to put an improved kind of feedback device into our lay education system. And we've been working on that, thinking about it, and certainly the device manufacturers have been launching solutioning efforts. Um, we've seen several promising early devices, but you probably saw the device that we're putting into our training um, at the, uh, the conference here. We call it Big Red. Um, it's, a, it's a feedback training device that simply makes the connection between the pumping on a chest that, that moves the blood up to the brain and shows that when you're getting it right, the brain lights up and you're actually getting something done. We found when we were looking at um, our responses when folks were coming out of our classes that about half the people when we asked the question, now that you've taken this class and you're certified, do you feel like you could save someone in an emergency? About half the people kind of said, I'm not so sure. Right? Uh, another question we used to ask was, uh, now that you've taken this, uh, would you step forward in an emergency? And about a third of the people would answer, we're not so sure. This device, we think, make what we're hoping, and we're going to test this because we have a lot of longitudinal data over time, is that um, this device will make people more confident. If they're more confident, they're more likely to step forward. If they're more like more people are more likely to step forward, the, the, the law of large numbers says more people get saved. Um, it's, so we think this is really a big deal. We're introducing these devices in all of our um, classes that we that, that Red Cross instructors teach at. I have three different channels to market. Two of them are my employees, and one of them is a network of instructors. Uh, we're, we're taking 6,000 of these devices and putting them into our classes in January, and we're going to then test whether or not people become um, more confident, and then over a longer time, will more people step up uh, in that last mile in the out-of-hospital area uh, and, uh, and, and work it. Um, this last mile thing is a big thing. I have about uh, 85 salespeople, just to give you the idea of law, law of large numbers, who help companies and organizations comply with their OSHA regulations, you know, selling them training, making sure they refresh it every two years. And about three and a half years ago, uh, we, we as a uh, as a courtesy, would, uh, if someone wanted an AED, we would essentially not only help them purchase the AED, but then we would do the AED training. About three and a half years ago, some of my, and I only have 85 of these folks, said we really should be doing this more often in terms of asking people do they want AEDs, and so we, had, we adopted a uh, do you want fries with that sort of approach to AEDs and started proactively asking would you like an AED. For the last three years, my 85 salespeople have placed more than 3,500 AEDs in, con in, in institutions around, around the country. And that, you know, remarkably, I always liked the, the thought about an AED is going to go off someday and save somebody's life. And 3,500 AED placements every year for the last three years was a sea change in terms of what we were able to do, and I think it helps a lot in terms of what happens in the last mile. So this was the big red mannequin, in case you didn't see it. As I said, we're going to test it, um, and we're hopeful that it's going to improve confidence. But, and this is my last page, cracking, you know, this last barrier, there's, a, there's several things that have to happen, right? Um, first, I think we have to marry the existing app technology, especially GPS location finding, so that we can find both the emergency and people that are qualified to respond. We need to figure out how to make more people more confident. More, you know, the, the average man in the street is the guy or the gal that has to essentially be confident to step in before the emergency help arrives. And I think that happens with improved device training that improves confidence. I think the CARES out of hospital survival database, Brian and I both served on the board of CARES together. Um, and this idea of having a registry that the IOM recommended to that it's in all 50 states, getting that data, first of all, getting that data collected in all 50 states, and then this is the important part, putting that data into AI computing capabilities where applications like IBM Watson and other things you're seeing on television can actually parse the data and begin to identify both holes in the area where we have responding capabilities and hot spots where we're doing really well and trying to figure out why it is that we do. And a lot of you know that in some parts of the country, like Kings County in Seattle, uh, we do remarkably well uh, with the last mile, and there's other places not so much. 
Uh, we think all of this, you know, gets molded into a system where the local 911 data sets, which today are a big data problem because it's so balkanized. Some countries have the unique ability where the EMS organizations are unified into one national response organization. That's not the United States. But that data problem with all of these disparate systems can get solved. And I would tell you that I would point to the work of uh, the folks at PulsePoint, who we've been lucky to work with, too. They've got the right idea about where this is going. And, I'm and I, I believe that within the next five to seven years, the, the, the emergence of big data, coupled with artificial intelligence manipulation, is going to make the vision that Brian talked about is taking this thing down to zero a more achievable possibility. So with that, um, I will. Uh, Thank you for your time and attention, and uh, I believe you guys will uh, have questions. Thank you. Well, Brian and, <coughs> Brian and Jack, that was great. And um, you left us with a few minutes, maybe 15 minutes, to, for Ed and I to pepper you with questions. And um, so let me just start. Um, I'm going to start with you, Brian, but I think, Brian, we were talking before, and you're the Senior Vice President for ECC Programs which means that you have about 150 staff and probably around the world more than 400,000 instructors, right? Mm -hmm. And um, Jack is the president of, um, of uh, preparedness, health and safety for the American Cross. You probably have uh, more than 1,100 employees and several thousand um, uh, trainers. So with this vision of getting to zero, um, it seems to me like the, the role of instructors is gonna change quite a bit. And I'm wondering in 30 seconds, just you know, a, a quick response, how do you envision the role of instructors changing over, say, the next three years or four years um, in relation to your visions? Yeah, so I think for me, I think of instructors continue to be the backbone of everything that I've, that I've talked about. I think the opportunity to get more people trained, especially in the community, is critical. And it could be from not just learning about CPR, but learning about the, just activating 911 and getting that connection to the, to the dispatcher will be critical. Jack, with the technology, do you think the role of instructors is going to go away? Uh, no, actually, I think the role of the instructor, like Brian, I think the role of the instructor becomes ever more important. I think what ends up happening is we put technology tools in their hands that make them much more effective in the classroom. Um, when we did our big red video introduction, we actually prepared two videos. One was for uh, the people taking the class. Hopefully, they got to a place that said, I'm more confident now. Um, but with, we had an instructor video because we wanted the instructor to know we think this is going to make it easier for them to see who's getting it in the classroom very quickly and who's not, which allows them to spend time where their time is best spent. So I think the instructor role really um, gets elevated in this model. Um, and what ends up happening is we give them tools that make them even more effective in, in improving learning outcomes. Yeah, I would just piggyback on that and say I agree 100% that you know, the AHA actually, I think you all uh, said it first and we followed on with this idea. We want CPR feedback uh, in classrooms and it's the, both from wanting to get more high quality, ensuring that we're training people for high quality CPR, but it is to allow instructors to spend a lot more of their time remediating those that really need the help. and and not feeling like you've spread so thin across everyone. If some people have got it, fantastic. Let them go. Go work with the folks that need that help. Okay. Yes, I think the, uh, I'm getting the, it was interesting how digital technology and all of this stuff came out of both of you in that. And it is, I think it was, it'd be scary to the instructor, but I could see we had the same feeling when we got into more video mediated instruction and those kinds of things, but I think they've adapted well. What, if you had to pick one technology now, uh, Brian, what do you think that technology would be in the, in the short term that's going to make the biggest difference in cardiac arrest? Feedback. Fe feedback in training and feedback in real, real, real cardiac arrest so that you actually know precisely that you're doing that good, high-quality CPR. And Jack, what do you think? Well, just, uh, I won't, obviously we believe in the feedback uh, as Brian does, because we're making an enormous bet taking you know, 6,000 devices out of our classrooms this year and putting 6,000 new ones in. But I would say it's big data, if I had to give you a second one, because I think it's the data that allows us to begin to hone in on the places where we have outcomes that are suboptimal. 
And you know, these databases, which are so balkanized, so local today, makes just getting, as you guys in this room probably know, just getting three or four databases together is, is, is hard. Um, but I think uh, that, I that barrier is falling, and I think what's going to fall out of it is <laughs> the ability for us to be in better, it will be in more places at the right time. Jack, <coughs> I think um, when we were talking before, you said you started out in commerce and tech, and you ran some companies in the U.S., in Europe, around the world, uh, sort of tech companies. And, um, and then you came to the Red Cross about eight years ago and uh, have been doing this transition from books to apps to the digital age. And you're talking about big data. And I'm, I'm not sure that everybody knows what you mean by big data. Brian, you started out as a basic scientist, right, in ischemia reperfusion at the cellular level, at, at the, um, really at the nuts and bolts. And you were talking about personalized CPR, personalized medicine coming in. Jack, when you say big data, um, what do you mean? What, like, how is that going to be analyzed? How is that going to make this more personalized? Well, um, it's a great question. And I th what, what I guess I would say is, is that um, there are so many things that are falling out now of being able to take large databases and and and, and to be able to uh, get through them more quickly. And um, I, I know I'm not being terribly articulated here, but it, uh, the, the technology is such um, that uh, we're going to be able to um, take a look at something like the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest database, which today about a third of it's being captured by CARES and two thirds of it's not being captured right now in any one database. Being able to pull that all together and then to have essentially artificial intelligence look for um, the seams in that data for improvement opportunities um, changes everything. And you know, it's like, it's like most things. Um, you really can't work on the problem until you can identify it and these new technologies are gonna give us the opportunity to do that. Yeah, I know and in our hospital when we're talking about big data you know, we, we, um, I work in the ICU, and we think we know a lot of things. We have these preconceived notions, these biases. And so, you know, when somebody looks wet, we give them a diuretic. We give them Lasix, and they, you know, and we go through these cycles of treatment with our protocols. <coughs> but it, behind the scenes, there's all these subtle things going on that if we can really get the fine details, artificial intelligence, computer technology, et cetera, can sift out the patterns probably even better than the human mind. And so we're finding that some of these things that are, we thought were tried and true over time are just emerging to be wrong and that we're taking off in different directions by using that. I think that it's that insight and the, just the notion of being able to collect more data more quickly. I mean, if you think about CARES, um, they're collecting data now in about a third of the country and they've been at it for about a decade, right? We really need all the data in the country collected. And once we get two thirds yeah. of the country added into that database, other things will fall out of it. So this notion of being able to collect more data easily and keeping yeah. it in a place where the storage is relatively inexpensive, and then being able to mine the insights that fall out of it, you putting it in the hands of practitioners yeah. that actually know what the you know what the, the insights mean, I think changes everything. Well, let me come back to Brian for a second, because I know over the years we've talked about data and in our instructor network, instructor networks. And uh, the data has been really critical. How critical is it that those in the trenches put in good data? Because if we're working off of that, you know, we had an instructor network and we were kind of going off of uh, lists of people who had been to the course, but we really didn't have any contact with them. How are you, how are you working to so kind of improve the system so that the data in is good and it really drives the outcome? Yeah, so I think it's uh, it's a challenge of any kind of manual data, whether it's you're trying to balance your checkbook manually or anything else. Bad debt, bad debt in, bad, no no ability to get good insights out. I think a couple of things, and just having more and more of our, you know, our, for us our instructor network, I think it's true also for Red Crosses and others. Uh, uh, having instructor networks online, and you can just start. More, it's more and more automated. But I think that to me, the promise of CPR feedback devices is, is not necessarily just feedback that's going to be sitting there in the classroom, but it's everything, you know, the cloud, right? So now I see the promise of even being able for both instructors, training centers, uh, training companies, training organizations to be able to see the quality of the data, the quality of the CPR that's occurring in the classrooms. And so it's, it's, uh, it actually would remove in some cases barriers for instructors to have to input data and, and just actually collecting that data 
uh, directly, I think, is uh, a big opportunity. And maybe being able to match that training data with their real data that, on the real I mean, to me, that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the whole holy grail, right? Is what you really want to be able to show is end-to-end -end from high-quality bystander CPR, high-quality EMS CPR, high-quality resuscitation care in hospital to outcomes. You get that whole continuum. I mean, that, that's how you start getting to zero. We have a lot of acronyms at this conference. We have GRA, and we have IOM, and we have ARC, and AHA, and of course, Are you Citizen create CPR another one for Foundation. Us? <laughs> <laughs> but it's Citizen CPR Foundation, if I had to pick our greatest challenge, it, and it really has become a theme of the conference, a call to action, is getting into the trenches and getting people to act. You know, lay people, healthcare providers, EMS, hospital. That's our greatest challenge, and we've been frustrated almost trying to think about that. How do you think, uh, and I'll start with you, Jack, how do you think this digital technology and that whole world and the new strategies are going to help us achieve that, to really penetrate the markets and get people to act? Yeah. One of the reasons I uh, admire the Citizen CPR Foundation and I find these conferences to be so compelling is that while Brian and guys like me can sit up here and talk about big technologies and you know, big institutions and things like that. You guys bring it home with the survivor stories. Um, I never find one that's boring. <laughs> I never find one that says, gee, I wish he'd get, over, get through it right away. Um, and it's those survivor stories that, made it, to me, just bring everything together. And that, that unique aspect you have here about getting, essentially, all of us together and then focusing on the, on the outcomes that happen. Um, Nothing motivates people in my organization more than survivor stories. And we, you know, when we get one, I'm actually now, again, this is a big data thing, but, um, you know, five years ago when we would have somebody who was saved, we didn't really know who taught the class. We didn't know who sold the class. Now, within one day, if I get a save story like I got last week in California, I can not only say, what a great job, I can turn to the salesman and say, hey, you know that class you sold to the XYZ company? Somebody's life was saved. And the trainer that was in the classroom, hey, one of your students saved somebody's life. And that animates everyone. And so I think the unique role of the Citizen CPR Foundation is that focus on the outcome uh, one person at a time. And there's nobody else, I think, in our ecosystem that does that better than you guys. I, I <laughs> I, that. No, I, I, could, I, I couldn't say it any better. I mean, I think this is not only the value that bringing this community together and the work that you all do, but it is it's a telling those stories. And I have to you know, admit that I don't think the Heart Association has always been as good in, in our past at thinking about how to tell stories and thinking about guidelines and science and data and thinking about telling stories, even you know, starting off my, you know, this video with, I, with numbers. But it's meant to tell a story. But this idea of telling stories because I think that is, when you think about movements, having a CPR march, having a movement like what we see you know, very nicely with, like, say, Susan G. Komen, is telling stories, and it's about people and making those people connections. I think that's what I think is a huge opportunity for all of us in our day-to-day -day work and is another opportunity for instructors. Help us tell stories about how we can actually make a difference and how we have made differences, right? So it's not... You know, theoretically, yes, I, know, I do know CPR, and I can theoretically save a life, but when you can actually put a, a, a survivor, the bystander, and I love, Jack, this idea of you know, talk about the instructors and the impact that this whole system made to save that life, that's, those are more stories that we need to tell. I think it, it really brings it home. I was, um, during this conference, I was sitting with Helga Mikkelbus, a friend, um, and he had done a back-of-the-envelope calculation, and uh, when Tor Lairdahl had presented during his Hans Dahl Award the numbers of people who arrest and the EMS calls, et cetera, he did a back of the envelope calculation and he figured out that one out of every 20 people will actually respond to a cardiac arrest during their lifetime. So if we look around the room, let's say 400 people, you know, one out of every 20 is going to encounter and respond to a cardiac arrest. And if we think about it in our families and friends, our circle of family and friends, everybody's got 20 family and friends, and one of them's going to drop dead and be needing CPR. So that immediacy, that story, that, that's what brings it home, that we have to be prepared. But I'm going to kind of close this session with a, with a tough question. I know, I know I didn't prepare you guys 
ahead of time for this. I apologize for that, sort of. But there sometimes is an, a, a perception. I think there's a perception out there that the Red Cross and the American Heart Association aren't always working together, that there's competition. And I'm wondering if there's, how do you see healthy competition, but collaboration and cooperation? How do you see that moving forward? What, what, what are we doing to kind of break down that barrier, or at least the perception that we're at odds, but we're, we have the same goal? Uh, so either one of you guys can start. Well, as Mark Twain once said, I'm opposed to millionaires, but it would be dangerous to offer me the position. Um, <laughs> I, I kind of feel the same way about monopolies. I think, I think healthy competition makes everything better. And I think while American Heart and the American Red Cross essentially come at this sometimes from different perspectives, and we're not a research institution. That's what they do. They're really good at it, too. Um, um, we're not going to try to compete with them on the research dimension. It's not who we are. We're more of a practical organization trying to figure out how to work in local communities. I think the fact that we're both in the marketplace trying to figure out how to do things better makes both of us better. Brian and I have said, you know, we, we work together, we've known each other for a while, and we've served on a board together of a, of a CARES organization. So um, I love it when his guys come up with something that makes me wonder why my guys didn't figure it out first, and I think he feels the same way. And in the end, we're all working towards the same objective. So I think competition just makes us better. Yeah, so I think, you know, competition creates innovation. We live in a, in a society where we want competition. And I would say, you know, we've also talked in the past, the problem is not about competing for who should get trained. The problem, I mean, we might collectively, I don't know the actual number, collectively maybe uh, all organizations pretend we train 30 or 35 million people a year in the United States. The problem is the other 250 million people that didn't get trained this year, that's the problem. So competing over, uh, that's even almost the wrong way to think about it. Um, and I would say that back to telling stories that I don't think we tell the story well enough that we jointly do first aid guidelines. We jointly funded the Institute of Medicine study. We jointly fund CARES. We're working together on the IOM National Collaborative. So in many ways, in, in all the appropriate ways, or many of the appropriate ways, we are collaborating. So I think there's more opportunities for that, but I also think we should be looking to, you know, allow separate innovation, and, and, but making sure we're telling the story we're actually working to, collectively towards getting to zero. Well, I want to thank you guys. Thank you, Ed. And Thank you, Jack and Brian, um, for you. a really great session. And I'm going to invite Dana to come up and take us to where we go next. Thank Thanks. you.